Hello everyone. Today I will give you a brief introduction to an ASHRAE position document on airborne infectious diseases in an easy to understand way. This technical document has just been reaffirmed by ASHRAE Technology Council on February 5, 2020. What ASHRAE wants people to know is, do not listen to rumors. Do not spread rumors. Listen to what our experts say. As the COVID-19 coronavirus is spreading across the United States, this document is beneficial for building designers and operators and the general public to understand how the virus spreads and how we can reduce the risk of being infected by properly operating air conditioning and ventilation equipment. The coronavirus spreads in similar ways to other infectious diseases. We are confident that its main routes of transmission are through droplets and direct or indirect contact. We are not sure it will transmit through small airborne particles, an aerosol, or how serious it could be if it does, and how to prevent it. Let's first look at how viruses transmit through respiratory droplets. An infected patient can generate respiratory droplets by coughing and sneezing. These droplets evaporate to become much smaller droplet nuclei with less than 5 micrometers in diameter. They are small enough to be swept by the air motion to places further away. These droplets and droplet nuclei will eventually fall due to gravity and land on a surface and become desiccated. However, activities such as bed making, dancing, or throwing things around nearby can eject these dry particles back into the air. How about the receiving end? These larger droplets typically won't be carried away by the air too far from the infected patient, usually within five feet. Even if the size of your nose is as huge as a horse, these droplets won't fly further than 33 feet. The size of the droplet nuclei will decrease as the distance increases from 100 micrometers within 5 feet to less than 5 micrometers around 33 feet. The 5 micrometer droplet nuclei, however, is easier to be swept away by air motion to other places. Scientists have not determined how the COVID-19 coronavirus transmits through aerosols, even though the U.S. health officials suggested Americans don't need to wear face masks. Some researchers say coronavirus can survive in the air for about a half hour, more than the 10 seconds to a few minutes for the virus to spread from here to here. The reason viruses typically do not transmit through aerosols is because the contaminated air will dilute very quickly in an open space environment. Based on this ASHRAE document, ventilation won't have a significant impact on the concentration, velocity, and direction of the respiratory droplets with a bigger size. However, aerosols can travel a relatively long distance through air ducts in the buildings. Because most HVAC systems in the U.S. are forced air systems, the virus could be transmitted through HVAC ducts to the same floor or even the entire building. Let's look at the mathematical model of airborne infection. The equation looks complicated, but it really isn't. C is the number of new infections in an outbreak. It is proportional to S, the number of susceptibles. Other factors include the number of infectors, I, and the number of doses of airborne infection added to the air per infector, Q. The Q value depends on the type of infectious disease. The more infectious the disease is, the higher the Q value. For example, for tuberculosis, Q ranges from 1.25 to 249 quanta per hour. But for measles, this value could be as high as 5,480. P is pulmonary ventilation per susceptible and is mostly a fixed value. T is exposure time, meaning how long you have been around the infected patient. Lastly is the variable we can control, volume flow rate of fresh or disinfected air. For an HVAC engineer or building operator, we can increase the fresh air ventilation rate to reduce the risk of cross-transmission cross or person-to-person -person transmission through aerosols. Of course, lowering the number of susceptibles, S, and the number of infectors, I, and reducing the exposure time, T, will also help. There are three types of transmission through small airborne particles, obligate, preferential, and opportunistic. Obligate is an infection initiated only through aerosols. An example is Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Preferential airborne transmission can naturally initiate infection through multiple routes, but is predominantly transmitted by aerosols. 
These include measles and chickenpox. Opportunistic transmission is that infections can transmit through multiple routes, including by aerosols, but only in favorable environments. Is the COVID-19 coronavirus transmit through opportunistic transmission? We don't know. I have done laboratory research on how mycobacterium tuberculosis transmits through aerosols at the National Jewish Health Hospital in Denver, Colorado. This is me wearing the protective suit. Still have a lot of hair then. Literature shows this disease can transmit through aerosols, and I have observed it myself. The COVID-19 coronavirus is new, and nobody is certain yet if it can transmit through aerosols. Researchers have created many models of how flu viruses can transmit through aerosols. In the beginning, they didn't believe these viruses could transmit through aerosols. However, through many years of research, they found out it is possible for the common flu virus and rhinovirus, which cause us to have the common cold, to transmit through aerosols. As of 2004, this has been validated by real-world testing. Even though we are not sure if coronavirus can spread through aerosols, there are cases that other viruses can. One instance is an outbreak of flu aboard an Alaska Airlines airplane due to the plane's ventilation system. In the 1986 H1N1 virus outbreak, researchers had arranged the susceptibles to be over 6.5 feet, or 2 meters, from the infected patient. The susceptibles were still infected. It has also been found that the SARS coronavirus could be transmitted through the exhaust fans and restrooms in a high-rise building in Hong Kong, causing the residents in the entire building to become infected. Since we don't know yet if the new COVID-19 coronavirus can transmit through aerosols, what are the strategies to control our HVAC systems to minimize the risk of infection in buildings? First, increase the outdoor airflow rate, bringing more fresh air into the room to dilute the droplet concentration, possibly by natural ventilation, opening windows more often. Second, control airflow direction, you have to guarantee air flows from a healthy person to the infected person and not vice versa. Third, control room air differential pressure to make sure air flows from safe zones towards the unsafe zones in a building. The fourth strategy is using a personalized ventilation system that supplies 100% outdoor air, highly filtered, or UV disinfected air directly to the occupant's breathing zone. Other strategies include adding highly efficient particle filtration to central ventilation systems and utilizing an ultraviolet germicidal irradiation system, or UVGI, to disinfect the air. The ASHRAE document also mentions that, in general, the ambient air relative humidity plays a role in the transmission of certain airborne infectious diseases. Higher relative humidity can slow the evaporation of large droplets into droplet nuclei. Drier air would expedite the process and the much smaller droplet nuclei could be swept by the air motion to places further away. Another possible impact is that breathing dry air could cause desiccation of the nasal mucosa, making the person more susceptible to respiratory virus infections. Research shows that the transmission rates for the infected guinea pigs are different at various air temperatures and relative humidities. At a low relative humidity of 35%, the transmission rates are 100% at both 41 and 68 degrees Fahrenheit. At a high relative humidity of 80%, however, the transmission rates are much different, 50% at 41 degrees Fahrenheit and 0% at 68 degrees Fahrenheit. So during the winter season in a cold climate, it is vital to increase the air relative humidity. You may need a humidifier. For the common flu virus, let alone the new COVID-19 coronavirus, Nobody knows yet what the level of contaminated air concentration should be to be considered safe. During the SARS coronavirus epidemic, researchers in China recommended, in a hurry, to dilute the SARS patient breathing air by 10,000 times. This translates to approximately 550 parts per million carbon dioxide level. How can engineers help in emergency planning? First, you can identify vulnerabilities with air intake and airflow direction to make sure they are designed properly. Next is to confirm the building is in a safe zone. For designated shelter-in-place locations in a building, identify approaches to interrupting air supply and guarantee these locations are absolutely safe. Finally, identify cohorting possibilities for pandemic situations so that whole areas of a hospital may be placed under isolation and negative pressure. This table from the ASHRAE document is very useful. 
For each of the 14 building types, number one is healthcare facilities, number two is correction facilities, etc., what control strategies apply, and what are the application and research priorities? We can see that for healthcare facilities, all strategies apply. Dilution ventilation, temperature and humidity control, local exhaust. If possible, you can also use upper room UVGI and local air filtration to kill or filter viruses. Another example is the correctional facilities, building type number two. Dilution ventilation and local exhaust are the strategies to use. Also applicable are two UVGI strategies and air differential pressurization. Finally, let's look at number seven, hotels. What can we do in hotels? Dilution ventilation is one. Temperature and humidity control is another. Certainly, you can use air purifiers in hotel rooms for local air filtration as well. My overall impression of the ASHRAE document is uncertain. We are uncertain that the COVID-19 coronavirus will transmit through aerosols. We don't know the typical sizes of these virus particles. Experiments on animals are needed to make conclusions. So far, nobody knows the characteristics and parameters of how COVID-19 coronavirus may transmit through aerosols. However, what engineers can do is provide possible solutions to prevent this virus spread, even when its transmission mechanism is not totally clear. The solution may not be the most economical, but it should basically work. The current solution is using room carbon dioxide levels as an indicator. If the CO2 level is lower than 550 parts per million, you should be safe, even when there are infected patients in the same room. If the level is higher than 1,000 parts per million in a closed space, such as a basement, you'd better leave ASAP, no matter if there are patients there. What if you don't have a CO2 level sensor or detector? Use your nose. Your nose is the best detector after so many years of natural evolution. If the air doesn't smell fresh, run.